Spirit is saying to the family of faith this day. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. As if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear. Or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom, with no brightness in it? The Lord says, I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> this is not an easy week. An easy Sunday to stand up in the pulpit in front of all of you, every one of you who I love and respect, whose relationship I cherish, and make the attempt to proclaim God's word to and for us all. To be totally honest, I would rather not address the events of this past week in our nation, and I have written and rewritten at least the beginning of this sermon multiple times, both on paper and even more in my head. To even acknowledge these events seems to me taking a side, advocating and or defending the words and actions of one major political party over and above that of the other major political party. I have absolutely no desire to defend the horrific behavior the hatred, dishonesty, and disrespect that I witnessed. Nor can I rationalize advocating for and applying only the purest of motives to one or the other sides of this tragic and vitally important moment in our nation's history. So why say anything? I'm sure there are some sitting here this morning who are conflicted and confused, tired and exhausted by these events and hope to God to sit in this sanctuary in the quiet and peaceful still presence of God without having to hear one more word about it. And who believe they know, if I did address it, what it is I would say and what it is I believe. Who assume that they know how I vote and my particular stances on matters of social, economic, and political issues. Maybe a few of you who decided before you even left your homes this morning that if it was even alluded to, you were going to get up and walk out. Maybe you are deciding that right now. If so, I beg you not to. I have no intention of taking a political stance one way or the other, of giving my opinion my feeling, for that's all it would be, of who is being truthful and who is not. Of somehow claiming to know what happened 35 years ago. But I do feel called, obligated, to take a pastoral stance, to acknowledge and address the hurt and suffering of those people who as a result of this past week's events have relived their own painful experiences of sexual abuse, of telling someone and not being believed, and or of not telling anyone because of their shame and fear, and so the perpetrator continues to walk around this day free without any consequences except perhaps their own conscience. Friends, look around you. Look inside of you. Like it or not, whether you know it or not, whether you choose to acknowledge it or ignore it, deny it. There is not one of us, not one of us here, whose lives have not been touched by sexual abuse. 
whether you yourself have been, are a victim, or whether it be a friend or a family member, female and male, not one of us. You may think you know my political affiliation, Democrat or Republican or Independent, my leanings on social issues, liberal or conservative. You may think over 16 years of sermons and storytelling, you know everything there is to know about me, but I tell you today that you have absolutely no idea as to what my own, especially as a man, very private experiences have been, or just how personally disturbing and hurtful I feel the events of this past week. And in most cases, you have no idea about the private experiences of any other person here in this sanctuary this morning. But I promise you, there are more stories of sexual abuse present here than there are people. So why say anything? That's why. Because I will not be personally responsible or as a representative of the church be one more person to ignore or deny our shared experiences of sexual abuse. Especially in light of the sexual abuse that has gone on within the walls of the church for decades and longer. Priests, clergy, sexually abusing the most vulnerable and precious members of our society, our children. The church itself can no longer remain silent even if it makes us uncomfortable to hear such things. Our brothers and sisters, you and me, carry with us a hurtful burden of shame and fear, a profound sadness, a loss of not just innocence, but of our entire personhood, a deep and at times consuming anger and resentment that is only multiplied by the silence and denial of others that accompany us. They, we, shouldn't have to carry that burden, at least not alone. But that involves bringing these darkest chapters of our lives into the light of the day. Do we desire retribution and justice for the people who did these things? Consequences for their actions? Even just an acknowledgement of the lifelong trauma they have inflicted? Maybe a plea for our forgiveness? Yes. But more than that, we just want peace and healing for ourselves and for all those who suffer isolated, alone, and in silence. Can we be that for them, for us, for one another? For four weeks now, we have heard from the Hebrew prophets, learned about them, the world they lived in, the circumstances in which they found themselves, and asked ourselves how they can be a model for us almost 3,000 years later, how God's Word spoke through them and continues to speak through them to the church this day, how we can be a congregation that faithfully proclaims and practices a prophetic ministry. And then, as if on divine cue, God provides us with the most glaringly obvious of opportunities to actually practice prophetic ministry in the headlines of our newspapers. How will we respond? Can we place showing compassion ahead of our need to be right? Can we place offering love ahead of our need to win? Will we be a safe place where people can come and find help and healing? Will we be a place that listens without judgment? Will we be a place that offers understanding and compassion, mercy and love? Will we be a place that speaks up and works for justice so that fewer and fewer people have these stories to tell? And until such acts of violence are no longer tolerated as the way things have always been, the prophetic word is not just challenging, it is difficult. The prophet is called by God to tell us those things we don't want to hear. And to be fair, I think the things that they would rather not tell. Words that will make their audiences feel judged and criticized, convicted, hurt, and angry. Basically that we, God's beloved children, are not being faithful. 
faithful to the divine vision of the beloved community and the peaceable kingdom, faithful to the commandments and the spirit of mercy, compassion, and peace that undergird them, faithful to the imperatives to love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and to love one another as God loves us. It's really quite simple. And as a result of our fragile and flawed humanity, impossible to achieve with any sense of perfection and without some failure. We are not as faithful as we want to be, and certainly not as faithful as we think we are. There are not two groups of human beings, the faithful and the unfaithful, where we are the faithful and everyone else, those who don't believe what we believe, look like we do, speak like we do, vote like we do, love like we do, those who challenge us and make us uncomfortable are the unfaithful. There are only the unfaithful, or at least the less than entirely faithful, us. We make mistakes. We do the wrong things for the wrong reasons, and sometimes even for the right reasons. We do and say the wrong things, wrong as they stand in direct contradiction to the call to love. We don't treat each other with the respect and dignity of children made in the image of God, created and sustained, forgiven, and made whole by the love of God, the love that is God. We treat each other as objects, tools for our own satisfaction, our own entertainment, our own material success. We act more out of fear regarding our differences and the misperception of these differences as threatening to our way of being and believing. We learn to hate and tell ourselves that it is okay to violently defend by word and our action ourselves against these fearful and threatening others. And we call this faithfulness. Hatred and injustice can never, never coexist with faithfulness. Loving one another as God loves us is the difficult world word. And working for peace and equity and justice for all God's children is the difficult work we have been given. Hating is easy. Being greedy and arrogant and selfish are easy. Love is the difficult work we are called to do and created to be. The prophetic word is a word to God's people, to us, a difficult word, a challenging word, a word convicting us of just how far we have strayed from God's desire for us, how far we have strayed from the word of God delivered by the prophets and revealed to us in the prophetic word made flesh, Jesus. A prophetic word we have been called to follow, called to follow into the darkest parts of our human existence, called to shine a light, to be the light, that illuminates those darkest places, that they, that we might experience healing and peace and wholeness, a word of hope and love, the love of God, the love that is God, that we are called to bring to the most vulnerable, to the neglected, to the invisible and the forgotten, to those weighed down by the painful memories, the hurt and suffering inflicted upon us by other human beings. God is not asking us to choose sides, to make a decision about who is telling the truth and who is not. It is not about who wins and who loses. So then why say anything? Because God is calling us, called us then and calls us now to love one another as God loves us, to stand up for those who have been beaten down the vulnerable and afraid, to raise our voices for those who have long been silenced, to walk if necessary to march beside our brothers and sisters, carrying one another as we are able, out of the darkness and into God's marvelous light, treating one another with gentleness and mercy, with respect and dignity, resisting evil and working for peace and justice. So then why say anything? This past Friday, Lisa asked me if I had seen the video clip of the three-year-old granddaughter of one of her cousins. This little girl was 
singing and dancing with the type of unbridled joy that only a three-year-old can produce, twirling around her living room with arms waving everywhere, twirling. This was all going on in front of a television with the credits to the film The Greatest Showman scrolling in the background. I know it was The Greatest Showman because the song she was so enthusiastically performing to was one of the hit songs from the soundtrack, This Is Me. She is beautiful, amazing, a joyful little girl surrounded by the love of her family. And this miraculous little girl was also conceived as the result of her mother being sexually assaulted. As I watched her sing and dance so sweet and innocent, I thought of all the other sweet and innocent children I know in my own family. Two amazing granddaughters, an amazing grandson in this congregation, sitting on these steps this morning, everywhere, and sadly wondered what their future held. Would they one day be, an exper be experiencing the same pain and hurt felt by so many of us, male and female, young and old today? These are the opening words to the song. I am not a stranger to the dark. Hide away, they say. Because we don't want your broken parts. I've learned to be ashamed of all my scars. Run away, they say. No one will love you as you are. But I won't let them break me down to dust. I know that there's a place for us, for we are glorious. When the sharpest words want to cut me down, I'm going to send a flood, going to drown them out. I am marching on to the beat I drum. I'm not scared to be seen. I make no apologies. This is me. <laughs> So why say anything? Because of our beautiful, amazing children. And because this is me. Can we place showing compassion ahead of our need to be right? Can we place offering love ahead of our need to win? I apologize if this makes us all very uncomfortable. But it should. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And to God alone be all the glory.